by way of introduction, uh, for those of you that don't know Len, uh, Len Benda works at Earth Systems Institute, and his research is focused on the dynamic behavior of landscapes. He and his co-workers have contributed to wood budgeting technology, including the spatial and temporal, temporal variability of wood recruitment and storage processes. I know him from his work uh, in Oregon on uh, debris flow uh, behavior. He's uh, certainly um, been very active in California. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lee. OK. Uh, I think I turned my mute off so everybody can hear me. So I'll start just for five minutes or so, giving a little overview. And then Sam Litter will take over uh, and do the bulk of the presentation. So the tools that Sam will be talking about exist in a platform that we've called NetMap that we've been building since 2007. And it's been a collaborative enterprise. And you can see some of the folks involved. Many of these uh, agencies and others have direct interest in riparian management. But they also have interest in other uh, factors in watersheds. And so we have multiple applications. So that's, it was designed to be diverse to look at a host or range of different uh, activities. So what we're talking about this morning uh, is timber harvest and riparian management. But there are tools for roads, um, watershed restoration, pre-fire planning, post-fire planning, climate change, and conservation. And the main uh, sort of organizing framework is the watershed and, of course, the channel network, and particularly uh, aquatic habitats. So we start out with, uh, I just want to spend a minute on the sort of uh, data structure of what we refer to as a digital landscape or a desktop watershed. And it's basically a virtual environment where landforms and physical processes are placed in context with spatial patterns of human activities. And we start off with a DEM, uh, often the NED 10 meter, but we use LIDAR where available. Uh, we create, um, we have a series of flow routing algorithms that create an adjustable, what we refer to as a synthetic river network, which is directly derived from the DEM through a flow direction grid. And we call it synthetic to differentiate it uh, both in its origin and its applications from cartographic stream layers like the NHD, uh, which has very limited utility uh, in trying to work through analytical issues related to resource use and conservation. So the network is built uh, with segments that can be one to 200 meters long. Um, the flow routing uh, algorithms and uh, allow all the cells to be addressed to each other, referenced to each other. So it allows things like downstream routing like sediment or upstream routing for fish. You can also move things down the hill like sediment delivery or you can move things up the hill like salmon carcasses. And so there's all the spatial referencing of the cells, so everything knows where everything else is. Roads and pipelines or power transmission lines are laid upon the DEM. They're all broken at pixel cell boundaries. And they know where they exist with respect to things like channels, other roads, and other aspects like landslides. Of course, all road and uh, stream crossings are identified. So if you wanted to quickly calculate the cumulative habitat length and quality above every single road crossing, you can do that with a click of a mouse. Landforms are identified, specifically landslide type features, shallow failures, debris flows, earth flows. Uh, landforms can be mapped, such as terraces, floodplains, and alluvial fans. Uh, within this uh, spatial context, we would then consider a riparian management, either at the REIT scale, which you might see right here, 100 meter scale, uh, which Sam will be talking about primarily, or at the entire watershed scale which, of course, is an issue regarding cumulative effects. Uh, the tools are running in ArcMap 10101. There are six or seven modular add-ins, approximately seven tools and 100 parameters. You can create your own uh, digital landscape, again, which is a um, synthetic stream layer connected to its DEM with other, um, other um, attributes that are provided. 
and there's a series of different modules. And the module we'll be talking about today, at least a couple components, is riparian management. The current and pending coverage uh, is what you see here in red and, blue and green. Um, different agencies fund different aspects of this uh, library of digital landscapes, and they're running about 2,000 square kilometers or 500,000 acres per data set. And then um, we tend to move towards the east later this year. And so the tools that you're seeing today uh, of, uh, have been derived out of issues out of Western Oregon, but uh, they're going to be made available, of course, to all users across all areas, which is one of the ideas behind the community basis of NetMap. Um, before I turn it over to Sam, I, I wanted to just give a very brief um, overview of what is the motivation for us in terms of spatially explicit riparian management that I think Mike gave a nice overview of. Um, there are issues uh, coming very front burner in western Oregon and eastern Oregon, as well as other places like California. But I'll just reflect on the, the western Oregon uh, at, um, information. And that is um, the Forest Service, of course, has a Northwest Forest Plan engaged since the mid-1990s. Uh, they have developed uh, large, uh, large two-tree buffers along fish-bearing stream and one-tree buffers on non-fish-bearing. And in many, uh, as many places, these buffers are not old growth. They are dense second growth stands, as you can see um, right in this example right here. So uh, the Forest Service wants to thin in riparian zones to open up the stand, create larger wood faster, for including for um, wildlife habitat. But NOAA Fisheries is concerned that the removal of any wood from the stream from thinning would be a, a, a very bad thing. And they include wood of any size category, even small wood down to 10 centimeters. And so we were asked to build wood recruitment tools, which we did, and you'll see Sam uh, discussing those. The other uh, motivating factor is that the BLM needs to come up with a new management solution for their own sea lands in western Oregon. And this is because the, the counties depended upon uh, timber harvest in the Owen Sea Lands, and ever since the Northwest Forest Plan came in place, the timber receipts have been uh, very low. Used to be subsidized by the federal government. That has been stopped effectively. The b counties are going bankrupt. So there's interest at the governor's office, the congressional delegation in Oregon, all the way to the top of the Interior Department. And the idea is, is to change the management into a more spatially explicit riparian management in these O and C lands. And so some areas there will be greater timber harvest, other areas there will be less, but there will be uh, more flexibility, including in riparian management. So the tools you'll see that Sam talks about today is coming from that perspective. Uh, and there's also a large movement in eastern Oregon to move into riparian zones that are considered fire hazards and also bug uh, uh, problems and, and various other things. But it seems like the political will to address these issues um, are increasing really quickly. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Sam. OK, thanks, Lee. Um, Maybe just by way of introduction, uh, I'll let you know about Sam. Uh, Sam is not in California. Sam uh, does work for Earth Systems Institute, and she's worked there for three years after she completed her PhD in postdoc uh, research at Colorado State. Her research focused on modeling cumulative watershed effects and climate change. And at, uh, at Earth Systems, she continues to use and develop those skills. So with that, it's all yours, Sam. OK. Thanks, Richard. Um, I hope everybody can hear me OK. And uh, I'm going to continue on with what Lee was talking about, but I'm really going to zoom in to the, the NetMap tool set and talk about how you can use it for spatially explicit riparian management. So we're going to look at four different types of tools um, in, in kind of a stepwise procedure, although we, we lose the steps at some point. Um, so we'll look at fish habitat distribution and quality, at debris flow risk, um, and also some landsliding, and upslope wood recruitment. Also, we'll look at the uh, stream bank wood recruitment and thermal loading. 
So most of the data we're going to use, so the, the examples that I show you, are from Lake Creek Basin, which is part of the Alsea River. And uh, this is in Oregon, you probably know. And you can see there on the aerial photo that there's been a lot of different forest management techniques that have gone on over the years. And uh, there's some more planning, so there were some different scenarios that we were able to look at. So first of all, we would want to define where, would the, where are the fish bearing streams? Um, where are the fish likely to be, and what is the quality of those streams for different species habitats? Here I'm showing coho habitat with a gradient less than 8 percent, and that's what you see in the red. That's a simple binary. Here is good coho habitat, and here there isn't. And you can do that for different species. We've got some um, different bells and whistles on there that you can tweak so that you can look at the gradient less than a certain value or habitat with gradient greater than a certain value. If you want to look at the quality of the habitat, you look at the intrinsic potential. Here we showed the uh, coho intrinsic potential. This is based on physical attributes of the reaches, and it might be um, things like the gradient, the channel width, valley width, uh, flow, you know, annual flow, things like that. And again, we've got um, built-in models from several different papers, and also you would be able to add in your own data for that. So here we're looking at a fairly moderate value coho stream. And you can see on the legend there, the warmer colors tend to indicate um, higher intrinsic potential for coho. There's only just a little bit of yellow um, on that one reach. If we were to consider steelhead instead of coho, we'd see that the IP values go up to about 0.8, um, quite a bit more yellow on the reaches to the eastern side there, the northeastern quadrant. Let's move into the slope stability concerns. Um, we've got several different models that you could use to evaluate um, different slope stability. But initially, the one thing that's shown here is the generic erosion potential. This is an index based on the convergence, hill slope convergence and slope. And on the map there, again, the red indicates the high instability potential. And so you can see that there's several reaches, several hill slopes there that um, have a high potential. If you want to look at degree flows instead, um, this is obviously a significant component of your sediment budget and it uh, can influence the diversity of, of channel and valley morphologies. We've got a probabilistic model that's calibrated for the Oregon Coast Range, so it would be okay for other human humid mountain environments that have steep headwaters. And here you can see there's, there's several different places. Again, the, the warmer colors on the legend indicate high debris flow potential. So let's combine those last two layers that we had. Um, sorry, that's not the last one. It's the coho intrinsic potential. And here we've got the debris flow um, wood delivery. And Again, for both of them, we've got high values of the warmer colors. Um, and this is going to identify likely sources of large wood for anatomous fish. Um, and remember, that's kind of a, a double-edged sword, too. It can be the wood can be good sources of nutrients. Um, an alter morphology for the positive by forming pools that enhance fish habitat. On the negative side, it can bury that same habitat. And the biota and the fines can cause a lot of hardship downstream if you're considering sediment. Here we've got the, the coho IP with the free flow, flow wood delivery. Um, and that's just indicating where you're likely to get wood into your reaches. So I'm going to move into the wood models here. And there's three that we'd like to consider today. Um, and the difference between the three of them is whether they are temporally and spatially explicit. I think that for um, riparian management, the spatially explicit, they're actually all going to be useful. It's just a matter of what area you want to consider in your management. If you want to consider a reach scale or project scale, you use the reach scale model. And that has a little bit more detail in it than the other models. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The watershed scale actually uses that same reach scale technology in a little bit less detail, but it does consider the entire watershed. And then we've got a new model that's under consideration. It's not 
it's not built in yet, but it's the snapshot scale, which is spatially explicit, and um, it will only be a snapshot in time. It's using the GNN data, the gradient nearest neighbor, which is put out by Oregon State. So let's jump in. Um, here, I'm, I just got a little snapshot of the, the data that we're using from Lake Creek again and indicating one reach that we're looking at. And you can see there's all sorts of different different treatments here. Um, I haven't got a legend. I've got this later on on a, another map with a legend that will show you exactly what's going on. But I'm just going to zoom into that one reach. This is how we would consider that reach in a spatial context. You can add in three different forest stands on each side. You'd add in the channel widths, stand widths, and hillside gradients. And the other input for this is going to be um, stand tables from forest growth models. And we have used successfully the uh, FES, Bellig, and Organon. There's some other um, interesting things that you can use here. I've mentioned those top few ones. But we also consider bank erosion in the model and the wood that results from that. Um, wood decay, when you accumulate the wood over time. We use taper equations to give us the sizes of different trees, and that will change the volume quite a bit over time. And then we can do this thing called tipping, where we take a certain percentage of thin trees, and we're able to tip them directly into the stream. So if you really could manage your wood, that would be one thing you'd want to look at, how your, your thinning and tipping scenarios compare to your reference conditions. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. So this is a um, kind of a sensitivity analysis that we did with some data from Lake Creek and some simulations. We've got 11 different scenarios here. Um, our left bank is always a no-action scenario. There's no, no harvesting at all on there. So the scenarios, there's uh, five or six each for with or without having a riparian buffer. So we might have a no-action buffer. Or we might thin all the way up to the stream bank. We've got a double entry thin it to 70 trees per acre from the bottom up. And this thin happened in 2010 and 2040. And then just to make sure this was really controlled, we held all the other parameters constant. So below there in the table, you can see the, the layout from the, the two different stands on the right bank. First of all, we've got stand one, which is a no action buffer. And it's just 10 meters wide, right next to the stream. Then on the outer, We've got 60 meters, and that's where the treatments change. We've got a no action, which gives us basically reference conditions. We can thin that buffer, or we can thin and tip to various percentages. Then below that, where you just see the single column, um, we thin that entire area, that stand. And that's a 70 meter stand. So that adds up to the, the same width as the stand one and two from the, the no action buffer scenarios. And the reason that 70 meters is simply because the trees are that tall. And if they're, if we don't have any taller trees, that wood is obviously not going to make it to the stream. So again, we go in and thin right up to the stream. And we can thin and tip in various percentages. So here's some results from that. Um, there's a lot on the slide, so I'll go through it slowly. Two different plots. One shows the no buffer, where we thinned right up to the stream. That's the top one. And then the bottom one, we used the 10 meter buffer. And that's there's no action in that, no treatment at all. So we've got a year on the x-axis. And then on the upright axis, we've got the wood volume, meters cubed. Um, and I think what's more interesting here, rather than looking at the absolute numbers, is to look at the relative differences between each of the treatments. The green line on the solid double green line is basically the reference condition that's untreated on both banks. And I should also say, the, in the legend there with the lines, I've got the left bank, which is always untreated, and then the slash, and then the treatment on the right-hand side, whether it's untreated or whether it's the thin or the thin with the tipping. So you can Sam, see can you explain what you mean? Sam, excuse okay. me. Uh, can you explain what you mean by tip? Yeah, it's um, when we, we have the ability in the model when we calculate how much wood is is um, is removed from the thinning, we are also able to tip in certain trees. And these in the model are calculated in one meter increments back from the back from the bank. And the 
what that means in, in modeling terms is that the probability of that tree falling into the stream is a 1, as opposed to a probability that might be less than 1. So it, it results in a lot more wood in the stream. And it's a management activity that I've heard various people talking about doing. Um, some people have been able to do it. Some people are considering it. Does that make sense to you? OK, I'm not getting an answer. Um, I'm going to use the pointer here. Um, so here's my, my green reference line. And again, this is untreated wood. Same on, on both plots. And I'll just, I'll just go to the top part here. The, the solid purple line is the un, um, double thin right up to the stream bank. So you, you can see that you lose, over time, you lose quite a bit of wood in that in that scenario. These other dotted and dashed lines are all different percentages um, of tipped wood. They, so they indicate how much more wood there is in the stream when you do the thin and you do your tipping. And that's the difference that you can see here between the solid line and then this line is 5% tip. This is 10% of the wood that's thin is tipped. And the dotted line is, means that 15% of the thinned wood is tipped. So you can see from the two different um, thinning treatments where we did tipping, the first one was in 2010. And unfortunately, we don't have data before that to really show what it started at. I, mean, I guess we could look down here, but it doesn't give us much of a time. The second one in 2040, you can see that there's a whole lot more wood put in, into the stream. Uh, and then it takes about, what, 30, 35 years to really um, to see the difference made up in the reference condition. So for stream restoration, in that first 60 or so years, you're going to have a lot more wood, um, even in the reference condition, and certainly a lot more than the thinned without the tipping. So it's, it's basically the same for the, the lower graph. All the, the lines are the same. But it's just showing you that the buffer is reducing the effects of the thin and tip by reducing the loss of wood overall. Um, and in the longer term, too, that, that convergence of the lines is a little bit later in time rather than being, um, what's that, 2070, 2075, something like that. It's, it's closer to well, the next decade. So if I summarize that in this table and add up the total volume of cumulative wood over time, and this is not accounting for um, decay in this particular table, but that this is basically adding up the columns in that previous plot that we saw. And I've sorted it by increasing volume. So what I've got is each, each different scenario here. And then I've got the, um, the volume in cubic meters and in, in the parentheses here on the right-hand side. Um, this is the percent change from the reference condition, which is in this lovely orange color here. So you can see that um, the tree tipping from the thinning operations combined with the riparian buffers really offers the highest, highest of the um, volumes of wood loading. So I'm going to move on now to the watershed scale wood model. Um, and I've just got a quick concept here of, of showing you what the inputs are. Again, they're sand tables from forest growth models. And we pre-process those in the reach scale wood model. Um, and we end up with a lot of different tables there. We don't just do one sort of one scenario. We run a whole bunch, and then we can bring them in and integrate them with the, the GIS in terms of the net map stream segments the stands, which helps locate where those tables are on the landscape, and the digital elevation model. And from that, we get a lot of the similar outputs and um, plots and, and maps that I'll show you. So this is just to show you the Lake Creek, um, the, hat, the, the stands as they are. We've got the, the pink and purple our plantations. Green is predominantly conifer, and the orange-yellow is predominantly 
hardwood. This is basically the same map, and I've overlaid it with the thinning treatment. So what it turns out to be is about 46% of the watershed is actually thinned in this one. And this is where we're thinning to the stream. And you'll see there's, there's some offsets there from the different maps. Um, but it, it basically, we're thinning all the way as far as we can on the plantations. This is the same map, and as you saw there, some pink dots showed up, and these show the buffers. Um, you see them in various places here. Here's a good place along here, down there. These are good places to look at. So I've gone straight to some results here. The top left-hand side is the, the raw output, basically, straight from the model. Um, what we're seeing here is a grid. And it would be about 140 meters wide, because we've got 70 meters of this is the highest tree height. I overlaid it with the thinning treatment. And this is um, thinned to the buffers. So you'll see that there's actually, um, even though I've got the, I'm showing the, the no thin buffers, it's showing a lot more wood there. So the, the dark pink, the lower volumes of wood, as you'd expect there, more on the outside of the area closest to the stream. Imagine that the streams are in the middle of these, these slightly blobby shapes. Um, and then I've lost my cursor. OK, so sorry, let me do that again. Um, darker pink indicating lower volumes on the outside of these areas. And then the green and yellow showing slightly higher wood volumes. And you can see them in some of these um, buffer strips where they're closer to the stream. Um, all through here on this main stem, and some through here. And then um, I took the, the difference between the two wood volume grids, and I um, calculated the, the difference there. This is what I'm showing in the bottom left. So the, the dark blue shows more wood coming from the no action buffer, and the yellow shows more wood coming from the thinned buffer. So we've got quite a lot of area where there's no difference at all, and then this this wood coming from the thinned buffer, which is a little bit further from the stream than this dark blue where more wood is coming from the no action buffer. And we think what's happening there is that this is uh, it's basically 15 years after that second thin, and what, 30, 40 years after the first thin. So we're going to have a lot of regrowth starting here. And in the, the place where the, um, the wood is, is thin, more wood is coming from the thinned buffer, you want to have taller trees there more of that wood is going to be able to make it to the stream. Um, I'm looking at this area here. The more of this wood will make it to the stream simply because it's a bit taller. Here we've got the wood that's closer to the stream simply because of the way that the, um, the buffers are. And so we're probably getting more wood from the, the unthinned or the no action buffer where the trees are going to be smaller, shorter. There's also, I just want to point out, there's a little bit of offset here with the uh, the raster and vector processing. And that's just a, it's just an artifact of what happens with that. There's not much we can do with that until we rewrite ArcGIS. Again, more outputs from the reach scale. And these are showing the wood volume by time. So I've got uh, my two plots here, the no action buffer shown on the left, and the thin buffer is shown on the right. Um, time is on the, the x-axis, and wood volume is on the upright. I um, just want to point out a couple of things that are really confusing in this. First of all, there's a little bit of an artifact here, and this is just the result of the SDS model parameters in uh, 1995. That's giving us a very high mortality. And I think there's a bit of the model ramping up to getting that. We have our thinning, which occurs in here. And then 2025 through about 85, we get more wood from our no action buffer, less wood from the, the thinned buffer, where a lot of that wood that would have been mortality, suppressed mortality, is basically removed and doesn't get into the stream. And then after about 2095, we start getting more wood from the thinned buffer. 
and around this side you'll see there's, there's actually very little wood in that time. And that's simply as the trees are growing up and we're starting to get more and more clarity from there. Um, the, the red ovals, again, this is a, a model artifact. The uh, Only one of the stands had data out there, so it was plotted, um, but that route just results in really low values. This is basically the same plot, and it's broken down by piece size in the, the different shades of blue that you see in the legend there. Um, and that's not centimeters, that is meters, sorry about that. But again, it's showing this very high initial, um, more wood coming from the no action buffer until you reach about 2095, and then more wood coming from the thin buffer. So if we summarize that, we can just uh, <coughs> excuse me, see what the total, the total is a decrease in wood of, of the smallest sizes and overall decrease in the wood going from the no action to the thin buffer. And that's simply this top piece. This is this is the total wood. And then I'm going down in the piece sizes that we saw in that last plot from um, 80 centimeters down through 10 centimeters. And this is on the x-axis. This is the percent change in wood from no action to thin. So we see this increase in the larger sizes. and increased in the, uh, excuse me, in the thin buffer, and then in the unthins with more wood of the smaller sizes. Um, this is the last plot on this wood model. This is basically showing the volume of wood. So there's a little bit of a switch here. Volume of wood is on the x-axis, and the number of reaches, the frequency, is on the y-axis. And generally, we're seeing smaller reduction in the smallest volumes of wood in the storage from the thinning, and that's indicated in the number of reaches that are in the, this um, smallest class, the 20. And then increases in some of the larger volumes in these reaches here. So the, the ones I'm pointing at, this purple, are the thin buffer for these three. I tend to ignore these a little bit as outliers, because they're really indicating just one or two reaches. And as it says there, we, we eventually want to compare the cumulative distribution of the wood storage um, over 100 year periods, and that's not yet available. So um, talking of not quite available yet, the snapshot model is still a, in the conceptual design process. But I just wanted to show you what we'd use for data for that so that maybe you have an understanding of it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the GNN wood data, the great nearest neighbor, this is an extrapolation from um, forest inventory analysis and the Landsat, I think it's a supervised classification, possibly unsupervised. And they've got a lot of good wood data there. If you've never seen it, it's, it's really interesting data, lots of different values. We're able to get the snag density, um, which gives us mortality when we divide it by a longevity value. We can get the average height diameter, and then we use that. We combine that with our GIS data, the distance the hill slope gradient, and the channel width. Calculate that with the probability of, of the wood falling into the stream using a random fall direction. And then, as I said very conceptually, outputting maps of reaches similar to the, the other ones that I showed you. So the data for that looks a little bit like this. On the left-hand side, the drainage wings. This is a net map function. Drainage wings are basically hill slope areas that drain into each individual reach. And so you can see that the reaches are shown in purple, and then the drainage wings are shown in um, all sorts of different colors, just to basically show those areas. And you can you almost see the topography when you look at them, uh, the divide going all the way through there. Same area here. Again, this is from the GNN data. I've got stand height and the snag trees per hectare. Um, and they're various, various sizes, size ranges. So that's the end of what I'm going to talk about with the wood modeling. But I just want to sort of summarize a little bit the applications. 
um, for multi-scale analysis, we've got the reach or the project scale versus the watershed scale. Eventually, we'll have that uh, GNN snapshot model. What that means is that you can do the spatially variable approach and analysis. You can see what's going to happen from your various riparian treatment scenarios, whether you choose to do thinning up to the stream, whether you use buffers. You can overlay those with habitat. And you can also try out designs for different mitigation. Um, and the tree tipping is the one that I talked about today, where you can thin and you can tip a certain percentage of those trees into the stream directly so that you know that they're in there. The last step that I'm going to talk about today is modeling the thermal loading in the stream for various different forest conditions. So we, we've got, it's kind of a two-step calculation. Um, first of all, we calculate the direct solar radiation. And the indirect is, which is a function of um, the water vapor in the atmosphere. But each, each of those takes into account the solar altitude, the solar azimuth, um, and the topography. And then we've also, in NetMap, we've got in the stream azimuth. And we allow the user to. Um, let me go to the next slide. We allow you to set up a similar idea, two buffers on each each side. I'm just showing one here. Here's my stream. Oops, you can't see my mouse. I'll use the green one. Here's my stream. And we've set up a buffer that could be about 30 feet or 100 feet or whatever width you choose. And then a treatment beyond that. So um, the inputs, I'll show you this slide. You can use um, the average tree height or your stand height. You would put in the buffer width that I just showed you there, and the vegetation density. And that density will change according to the forest type and the, the thinning or the treatment type, whatever is done. So you can put in your buffer, the riparian buffer, or your outer forest there. You're able to select re certain reaches or just do the entire watershed. And the reason I, I like to show at least one GUI from NetMap is really just to show what it looks like. You know, there's a lot of help on here, lots of information. Um, we try to make things as easy as we can. There will always be a, a help button that allows you to run help at some point. Some warnings that it's going to take a long time and you need to go away for lunch or for the evening. And then typically there'll be some map display options too. And for this one, we can display the vegetated conditions and that will take into account the changes that you've put into these two boxes. We can, um, we also calculate the bare earth radiation. So this is, as if you click, as if there's no vegetation there whatsoever. And then we calculate the difference between those two. And you're also able to, using GIS, you can calculate the difference between um, different scenarios. And let's look at some results. And this is exactly that, it's the difference between um, the fully vegetated and the bare earth scenario. So again, I've got um, the big differences are shown in the warmer colors. And up here on the southeast end of this watershed, there's some sort of flatter upland areas where you can see that there is a big difference. There's a huge difference there between bare earth and remote and having all the vegetation in there. And then the next thing that's really cool I want to point out about this is that you can actually see the, um, you can see or understand the topography by looking at this, this line here, this difference between the aspect of the different, um, different sides of the stream. This is it's about the main stem. So one side, the south facing side, you've got a large difference there. When you remove your vegetation, obviously that's going to cause a huge difference along the North facing side is simply not as much when you remove that vegetation. You don't, you don't have as much um, solar radiation hitting that, that aspect because it's facing north. Something else you can do um, in the GIS is look at the difference between two different um, two different treatments. So here we've got a, a no action buffer, riparian buffer, and then the vegetation density is 0.8. I'm assuming that might be an untreated area. 
and here we've got a 100 foot buffer. And beyond that, the thinning has brought the vegetation density down by 50%, basically. And what this one is showing is that if you look at these two very closely, you're not going to find a difference. And the reason is that there is no thermal effect when you've got 100 foot buffers, and you can do whatever you want pretty much beyond that. So that's the end of my in-depth look on the tools. And at this point, I'd like to switch it back to Lee. And he's going to do some summary and big picture. OK. Um, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize a few things that Sam was going through. Before I jump into it, I just have a few slides to sort of uh, wrap it up in the big picture. Um, one is that the entire wood modeling approach is based on this idea of a wood budget, which means it's a uh, quantitative accounting of the factors and, and the um, geometry of falling trees into streams. So the factors, might in, the factors do include stand density, tree height, diameter, uh, mortality rate, and of course the channel width is important. And I'm sure Sam has mentioned some of this, but again, I want to emphasize what these pieces are. And uh, we have used stand growth models provided by the U.S. Forest Service. These are like Zelig, Organon, and FDS. And you get different results if you use the different models. And uh, they generally go out 100 years, sometimes more. But the general thought is that they're not reliable beyond 100 years. Uh, and, and so you get um, inputs every five years where they give you a new stand density, a new, uh, and so what the model takes is the number of dead trees, and then that gets translated into tree fall. It can be random tree fall, it can have a preferential fall towards the stream channel. Um, Sam has made a really nice interface and the user can select that. So there's lots of bells and whistles in the interface. And she, she mentioned tree tipping, and that's an important factor. And I, I just want to tell you where it came from. Um, the, the, uh, the federal agencies, uh, or the Forest Service BLM, would like to thin because they think that these dense second growth stands are um, an unhealthy situation all around. But when they do, they remove the mortality component. And you saw the reduction that Sam was showing, at least 50% of the wood you lose. That is unacceptable to NOAA fisheries. And it might be uh, unacceptable to many of us. Um, and so the question is, what do we do about it? So you can either design a buffer, and it can be a 30 foot, 100 foot buffer, uh, and that will mitigate um, you know, either a portion or all of the effect that of, of, a, of a loss of wood. Or you can put a tree tip component, which means the trees that you would have taken to the mill, um, you directionally fell them instead into the stream. And so the question was, what percent in a heavy thin, going to 70 trees per acre and starting at about 170 trees in a dense second growth, what percent would you have to leave on site, which is to say tip into the stream, to reduce the loss, to eliminate the loss that you're going to get from the thin? And again, we're thinning right to the stream edge, no buffer. And the answer in the Oregon Coast Range using these model results was 12%. You have to put 12% of those trees into the stream and not take them to the mill. And those are the ones closest to the stream. And you then will have offset any loss you'd have got from thinning to the stream edge without a buffer. If you go above 12% to 15% or 20%, you get a larger influx of wood into the stream. And in the channels in the Oregon Coast Range, which are depopulative wood. One. Sorry? Oh, I'll continue. Um, you end up with much more wood, which can be considered a res restoration effect. And you saw her plot where there's a lot more wood for the first 60 or 70 years, and that is a restoration um, uh, sort of effect of your management. And doing multiple entries, of course, is better for that. Um, another thing I want to mention is this issue of watershed scale. It is clear that the correct scale to analyze these riparian treatments is the watershed scale. Uh, the issue there, however, is that the user would have to bring to bear a rather large amount of information. They would have to have forest growth predictions attached to a set of polygons inside 
the watershed. And for the Forest Service perspective, for example, large chunks are non-managed old growth. So you bring that into the mix. And then as you go in and do your thinning, you will do that incrementally over time. And so you could dial in thinning in 2010, 2040, 2050. And so at the end of the century, you'll get an accumulative counting of wood, which is really an, which is really an analysis of cumulative effects as regarding wood loading. So that's, that's pretty uh, keen, but it, it requires a lot of information. And then finally, the snapshot load that Sam mentioned uh, could be very useful for an idea of restoration. For example, what is the spatial variability of wood loading right now across a large watershed? And that might tell you where you want to focus your riparian work or maybe where you'd want to focus other kind of in-stream work. Okay, so with that, I'll just, uh, just want to highlight some of those points that Sam made. And of course, the bottom line is, what do you do with all this information? And uh, the idea was you'd assemble the pieces and design forest management and watershed restoration in a spatially explicit way, which means you do, you do not have uniform uh, buffers everywhere of the same size. So let's just give you an example going into the Lake Creek that Sam was talking about. Let's start top. Up in these upper watersheds here, you can see in blue, oop, let me get the pointer, up in, um, so my pointer's not working, just so you know, um, that the three three dark circles up top. Um, there's no coho habitat, no steelhead, and the, the um, proposal, ah, great. Thank you. Um, so these three areas up here, these are headwater third order streams. And this, in this kind of lithology, um, there's no habitat up there for the fish, uh, anadromous. So the, the target is the no buffer and you thin and you want larger trees in the riparian zones for avian, avian and mammal habitats. Okay, then down here in this box that you can see in the lower end, it's the best coho steelhead in the watershed. You could put a 100-foot buffer and you could thin beyond. Um, the target could, could be no stream effects. Or you might have longitudinally variable buffers to increase large wood to habitat. And just this slide was made before the tree tipping tool. So, for example, you could put tree tipping into these um, scenarios or these uh, management prescriptions. And then here, you probably don't, well, you may recall, but this was the landslide and debris flow area. And you can see it even in the shaded relief, right? The, the stream is asymmetrically located in its basin. It's bumped up against this side of the hill. The hills are a lot steeper, much more gentle on this side. And so you've got debris flow delivery of large wood. So what do you do with that? you could actually go into the upper uh, tributaries and you could manage for larger trees faster. And although Sam didn't show it, uh, the work Tom Spees and others at Oregon State University, when they use these forest growth models and they run them out 100 years, they do show larger trees faster than in the second growth dense stands because they're opening them up and the remaining trees get more of the energy and light. And so you would tend to do that in these areas because what you want, the target is, large wood falls in the streams, get carried down by debris flows. And in some of this country in the Oregon Coast Range, debris flow wood sources can, can comprise 50% of the total wood load in streams over time. Now this is not true in, many, in all watersheds, but in the Oregon Coast Range, it's, it's, it's pretty important. And finally, if you could make a, you could do a package deal, which uh, people in Eastern Oregon are thinking about, which is to say, when you have a project to go in and do riparian work, you'd also do road work and you would do road restoration. And in fact, some of the proceeds from riparian management could actually go toward the road restoration activity to, to reduce mass wasting and surface erosion. So uh, again, uh, just a hypothetical example of how the Forest Service or BLM might use, um, might use these tools to design spatially explicit riparian management. Uh, also, just as an aside, Jerry Franklin, the godfather of uh, old growth, and Norm Johnson, who's at uh, OSU, have written a paper uh, called Ecological Forestry. And it is, uh, was asked, they were asked to write it by the Secretary of the Interior, specifically with the uh, ONC lands in the uh, Western Oregon. And what they're arguing for in this paper is what you see on this slide, which is basically that the idea of uniform buffers of varying widths no longer are appropriate ecologically for a variety of reasons, including fire risk and um, stream health. And they're proposing in this article uh, that, that flexibility be opened up. 
And so it's likely that could be a legislative solution, uh, the first one since the, Oregon for, uh, the uh, Northwest Forest Plan was implemented in the mid-Clinton years in the mid-1990s. Okay, I only have two slides and to, oh, to enter into another interesting problem that I think could be brought to bear in these questions, but that gets very little press. And that is uh, what you're seeing here, this is southwest Washington, and it's, I, the idea is that fire frequency is spatially variable based on landscape position. This is an empirical result that my colleague Dan Miller and I worked on in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And based on the distribution of stand ages back in 1939 before logging in a 1,000 square kilometer area, uh, you can calculate the relative probability of burning. Uh, and this, again, is a relative index showing that in some areas the fire probability is of, uh, you know, uh, lower, which is to say longer reoccurrence intervals, like three, 400 years. But then in certain parts of the landscape, the burning probability is much higher. And these would be on ridge tops, on south-facing slopes, and in headwater streams. Now you can take this kind of information and you can put it into a fire simulation model. And you can run the fire simulation stochastically across the landscape. You can remove logging and just run fire. And as you can imagine, you're going to end up with a distribution of forest ages. The distribution of ages will range from old growth 500-year trees to recently burned stands. And you can look at it at different scales, the probability distribution of forest ages, or you can look at it by landscape position. And the next slide I'm going to show is the distribution of stand ages as an average uh, with different channel types or different channel sizes and in terms of stream orders. So uh, we run the forest fire simulation model with topographic dependence on fire frequency to predict spatially heterogeneous nature of forest ages. Now, no one is going to dispute the fact that there is a distribution of forest ages out there before we came on the scene with forestry. Uh, you, can, you can argue over the details, but, but a, a principle is there is a distribution, there is not a uniform age, and the distribution ranges from very young to very old. Uh, so what you see here is the distribution by stand age and the proportion of the channel length, on average, that's in these different age categories. And let's start with, uh, let's not worry about zero order, which are, which are um, we call them swales. Also, ages over 200 years are not shown. We'll start with first order streams, the very headwater. And you can see the stand ages and the percent of channel length. And so if you look at this, it says, on average, over time, approximately 14% of the total length of first order streams are predicted to have forests less than 50 years old. And that's going to vary, right? This is an average. So if you look at the stochastic time series, this number would probably go from 2% to 25%. To it just depends where you are in time. But if you take an average look at this, this is the number you get. And you can go into second order and third order, and now you're getting into fish bearing, and fourth order for sure is fish bearing, and it drops to 8%. But that's still a large number, right? Because right now, the prescriptions say, the standard uniform prescriptions say, you want full old growth, total sun lock, uh, locking out coverage along every foot of fish bearing stream. But if you actually ran uh, simulation models of forest fire, you would never get that result. So you're managing towards some hypothetical thing that doesn't really exist in this case. And again, this is a result from Southwest Oregon where the, sorry, Southwest Washington, where the average fire frequency is 300 years. If you moved into a fire frequency of standard, okay, this is standard placing as well. If you moved into a fire frequency of 150 years, these numbers go up dramatically, right? And, um, and also there would be, you know, interesting dop dopographic dependency on fire frequency. And again, this is driven by um, empirical information back in 1939, and these results are on a um, CD-ROM that was published as a general technical report by the Forest Service in 2002. So I put this up because if you're going to start thinking about managing riparian zones with regards to disturbance uh, or in a spatially explicit way, uh, and you are still protecting landscapes from fire or have altered the fire regime, um, this is a nice way to think about the fact that your target is a distribution of ages, not a single age, and that the distribution can include younger age classes. And I think that might do it. 
Um, anyway, we have a website where you can see some of this. Uh, we're just about ready to post the new tools and the data sets. And um, you can always contact us with questions. So thank you very we much. And uh, we, we do have some questions, Lee, so don't go away. I'm going to uh, yeah. bring them into the center here. Um, so we'll start with uh, Diane Hopster on the wood volume graph. This may be for Sam. Uh, it appears to show that not treating the stream buffer results in more large wood in the stream long term. Is that correct? I'm guessing that that's the one with the two graphs, one above the other, where I showed the, uh, the 11 different scenarios, the no buffer and the 10 meter buffer. And it, yeah, if you look at that in the really long term, and that's a past um, about 90 to 100 years, yeah, you may get more wood from your, your reference condition um, in the long term if you think they're going to stay like that for that long. And I, can you, uh, I'd like to comment to that. Um, it's true that you intersect, those two curves intersect at like 80 years out. But Sam, the second slide that you had in that series shows that with tree tipping involved, you get more wood in the long term with a tree tipping component added to the thinning. Yeah, when you add that up over time, yeah, that was right. There were two graphs that we looked at, and it looks as if those two crossed. But the overall totals, which were in that table with the orange across that showed the reference condition, there were a lot of different treatments that had a lot more wood overall. So that's when you actually add it up. So that's the difference between those. Well, by the way, everybody, um, I want to note that the PDFs of these presentations will be posted on the website <laughs> along with the recordings. So keep your eye on those. Uh, there's a question here from Dennis Sloda. How and where was the model calibrated, and how confident are you in the predicted results? Let me just uh, say uh, something about that. The, the, um, the incoming data that drives these models um, primarily is the forest growth projections, projections out of a variety of different models, FVS, Organon, Zelig. Um, so that question depends heavily on those models. Those models are external to us or to NetMap. We take those results and we import them into a wood budget recruitment model, which I think we have fairly high confidence that we have captured the main wood recruitment uh, processes in a generalized sense. For example, if there's a massive windstorm blowdown event, that is not included in the model. Uh, again, that's because it would be a, a stochastic model at that point. Uh, you, could, you could put that in, but we uh, endeavor to go on a more simple path for these sort of applied sets of tools. So a lot of it depends on the incoming from the forest growth model. Uh, there's another question from Even. Uh, at what spatial scale are these tools efficient in terms of data necessary to use them? I guess there's a couple of ways to look at that. The uh, readily available data, 10 meter DEMs, um, and then whatever stand data are available, um, whether it's Forest Service or, or whoever else's data, you'd need to look at the um, what is an efficient, what is a, the right way to look at those, you know, what level are they mapped at. Um, the other part of that is, if you start going to finer and finer spatial scales, let's say, for example, you have one meter LIDAR, with the, the watershed scale model, one of the issues we've had with running that is that it's really computationally intensive because it's got to look at each cell to get the values for that one, whether it's um, the topography, the, the stand tables, and associate them with what's going on in the distances to the reach. If you start doing that, instead of for 10 meter cells, for one meter cells, you've got a whole lot more cells all of a sudden. And if that's the kind of efficiency you're looking at, then you may want to consider you know, that sort of trade-off between the time it takes to run it, the size of the data sets that you have, and the stand data, the accuracy of the stand data that you have, as well as actually the, um, you know, the, the stand tables that are coming out of the models, too. Um, I'm not sure of the, the spatial 
scale as those. I know the indentures and that's right there. A lot of times I'll put acre rather. Um, so again, what happens when you start using those at finer, finer scales? Are you are you going beyond the limits of your data? I, uh, I think I should use it. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, are you finished, uh, Sam? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question I don't quite understand. Are those streams the third order? Are they intermittent? The question might be, are third order streams intermittent? I guess that depends on the size of the watershed or uh, in region. the Oregon Coast Range, they are not. Uh, the intermittent would be, uh, the ephemerals would be for first order, second order. First order for sure. Second order may be depending on the climate, uh, previous year's precip. But the third order is flow, and there's fish in them. Uh, Diane's got another question. Uh, is the new version of NetMap available uh, for Region 6 Forest Service employees? Uh, yes, I just came back from a meeting with BLM and Forest Service in Portland on Monday, and um, that is uh, we'll be shipping BLMs uh, next week, and the Forest Service immediately thereafter. Uh, Joe's got a question here. The focus has been on increasing LWD in streams for fish, but how about increasing the expansion of riparian woody vegetation? I assume as the goal, and reduction of fuel loading in these areas. Does that change the approach or the tools? I guess, you know, increasing the riparian, the extent of the riparian zone for other benefits such as wildlife habitat. Yeah, I don't, I think you just wouldn't, you uh, you may not run the tool. So, for example, if uh, wood recruitment to streams was really not on the table, uh, then, you know, you may, you may not just, you may not run it. Uh, and you might have other kinds of uh, projections and, and concerns about the state of the riparian vegetation itself and less so about the adjacent stream. So I don't think it changes. It might change the approach. Uh, you might use a tool. You might not use a tool. And actually, you might use some other tool. Uh, question uh, begs the uh, issue of increasing the extent of the riparian zone and then having to deal with the uh, fuel treatments in those riparian zones, whether you're, near, whether you're affecting the stream or not. Um, it's a, Even's got a question over here. It says, to clarify a little, it wasn't obvious to me how much field data is necessary to run the models. The, um, the stand growth models, to my understanding, uh, to start them uh, requires uh, information from the field on stand density, diameters, height, um, so there would be some field data, a riparian data needed to be collected, I believe, as input to the stand growth models. Well, that's typically the way they're developed. I mean, in California, we have Cactus, Cryptos, SDS. You know, they're based on uh, plot, plot data. It's uh, remeasured over time. Um, and I don't think you've used Cactus or Cryptos. Have you, Lee? Probably not. No, I haven't. Yeah, that's um, okay. In any event, they're all sort of based on plot data, remeasured plot data, and they they the remeasurements continue to keep you know improving the models over time. So they they are validated over time. I, I had a question about the validation. I mean, uh, are you doing any experiments to try to do some validation, or do you have some experiments set up? Uh, that would be out of our purview. That would be the Forest Service or the user end. And uh, it would be a challenge, no doubt, because you're forecasting decades out. And the, the models predict a long-term uh, sort of averaging calculation. But as we all know, floods erode banks, tip trees in, winds knock the trees over, and uh, it's more of a stochastic load. And so to test uh, a stochastic prediction, uh, is not going to be easy, but uh, but I would say that is definitely falls under the uh, responsibility of the uh, proponent and the user. Seems like it would make sense to do some experiments in some of the long-term ecological research areas. Absolutely, but I, my suspect my suspicion, Richard, is that the experiments will start will now be starting to run 
on BLM and Forest Service lands and perhaps some private sector lands uh, because there is an interest and a need um, and some motivation to go right now. And so hopefully that's a good point because then they would hopefully set it up so that they could be uh, monitored over time, at least some of the activities. My guess is that that will be dialed in. And so it might be occurring in areas outside of uh, so-called research sites, um, as well as many research sites. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of old growth trees in there, and I suspect that these riparian manipulations are being done in altered riparian stands, uh, i.e., you know, uh, uh, previously harvested second growth or fire suppression has taken a toll, or they're full of bugs. Can you, can you brief us on uh, the application at MAC to, to California? Is there is anything uh, happening along those lines? Uh, we have a project to link um, erosion, roads, fish, and wildfire in seven national forests in the north end in California. And uh, um, so that's uh, online. Uh, we very well will probably map the entire landscape to San Francisco here very shortly. And those will be embedded in it. Um, so, yes, I would say in the next uh, six months or less, uh, we would be uh, moving down to California. And so you can uh, keep informed about the progress in California by going to your website? Absolutely. And we uh, send out email broadcasts every time we release data sets. And so next week we'll release Western Oregon and Washington. We're rebuilding all new data sets because the, the USGS has updated the DEMs. Uh, we have better algorithms, and, and we want more consistency. So we'll start working. Uh, we'll post data sets by half states, and we'll let people know when they're there. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions, uh, guys. So, uh, Mike, you want to wrap it up? Uh, I did want to tell people we only have about two thirds of the people left now, but. Uh, we have applied for continuing forestry education credits uh, for this program. And so if you are interested in, in that, then uh, feel free to contact me. Um, you should have my email address. Uh, if you don't, it's rrharris2464 at sbcglobal.net. So if you're interested in the CFE credits, uh, let me know, and I'll let you know when uh, those credits become available. So with that, I think we'll close the session, and thanks, everybody, for coming.